Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Twidell from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, today, Michael's going to talk about extreme research. Um, and Michael is a professor in the School of Library and Information Sciences at UIUC, um, where he does a lot of research on computer-supported cooperative work, uh, computer-supported cooperative learning, human-computer interaction, uh, and information visualization. Um, Currently, he's been studying um, informal social learning of technology, uh, technological appropriation, collaborative approaches to managing data quality, and the use of mashups to create lightweight applications, uh, and of course, uh, the usability of open source software. Uh, his approach involves the uses of interdisciplinary techniques to develop high-speed and low-cost methods to better understand the needs of people and their difficulty using existing computer applications uh, as part of the process to design future more effective systems. And I think we'll be learning a lot about that today uh, when Michael challenges us to think about uh, the future of HCI research. So thank you, Michael. Thanks very much. So... Um my title is Extreme Research Question um, Mark, and so I don't have an answer. Um, I have a lot of rants, and I'm hoping to uh, discuss with you guys some uh, possibilities um, of addressing this larger problem. Um, so this is also kind of like a verbal grant proposal. I'm sort of putting, you know, trying to put together my argument of how I might get the NSF to let me work on inventing some methods because I think our existing methods are very powerful, but never for what I want to do. We always seem to work for other people. So what is it that I do? Um, well, as Mary um, sort of summarized, um, I sort of feel I'm um, somewhere in the intersection between computer-supported work, cooperative work, computer-supported collaborative learning, human-computer interaction, and library and information science. But really what I obsess over is learning. How do people learn how to use an application initially? How do they learn how to get better with it? Why do they not get better with it? Um, and increasingly, I'm realizing that you can't just study a person on their own, because a lot of learning is social. And you can't just study one person or two people around an application, because outside the lab, people have five applications open at the same time, and they're copying and pasting between them. Uh, and when computer scientists do that, we call it a mashup. Um, but other people do it too, just using basic copy paste. So I want to, so I, I've been thinking about mashups as a technology that allows rapid prototyping, but also kind of like a metaphor, um, a way of looking at research problems that you combine together. So um, I think it's always useful to try and understand somebody by looking at their bookshelves. So I'm just going to take you through my bookshelf very, very quickly. These are books that I've read that I found inspirational. And if you can sort of, if you recognize the book, these books and run them through in your head, you get a sense of where I'm coming from. So all of those, very, very quickly, glance on the bookshelf. And what do you get as the distillation of all those books? Um, I think my design approach, although I've got a background in computer science, I don't really want to automate. I want to augment. Um, people are smart. Um, they can do things themselves if we design to help them. And what are the things that they do? Well, they do a lot of learning and helping each other. Um, but if I just say I'm going to study learning, I go in, watch what I think is going to be a, a learning interaction. Um, but then it can turn into a problem solving, because the learner asks the help giver, and it turns out the help giver didn't know either. So now we've got to, they've got to try and figure it out together. Um, and a lot of it then leads to what you might call innovation. And, you know, what's the difference between learning and innovation? Well, it's, it's kind of a weird one, but I would say it's learning if somebody knows it and I don't, and it's innovation if nobody knew it either. So it's a bit like research. Um, and a lot of this is involves sort of fiddling around with stuff and tweaking the kinds of things that computer scientists find very comfortable to do with technologies. A lot of non-computer scientists 
don't find that very comfortable, but some people are innovating, even though they swear blind, they're not a computer scientist. So I'm interested in how can we help people do this with other people, even if they're not computer scientists? What are the kinds of tools and resources and interfaces that would help them do that? So a few more rants. Why is it that I feel that the methods um, that we have in research don't help me do what it is that I want to do? Um, and I think this part of it is this distinction between science and engineering. So, you know, crudely put, I would say science is about finding fundamental truths about the world, and engineering is about making things better. Um, and I want to make things better. I want to help people learn more efficiently, more effectively, do more interesting things with the software to make the world a better place. Um, this is clearly not just a technical problem. It's clearly a socio-technical problem because we've got people who are using these systems. Um, and so if you want to study the socio-technical effects of designed artifacts, it's kind of difficult to do it in the lab setting because often in the lab setting, in order to do proper science, you control away all the messy, complicating factors of the real world, and it's precisely those messy, complicating factors of the real world that I'm interested in. So, you know, the, the simplest socio-technical issue I can think of is password design. So passwords are normally think, you know, thought of as something where there's a technical fix. Oh, um, that's a bad password. I, as a systems ad administrator, am going to enforce you to have a longer password because longer passwords are safer. And longer passwords that also include numbers and um, various you know, top level of your keyboard things of asterisks, exclamation points, they, they are also safer. So longer is safer. And in a technical perspective, that's true. But in a socio-technical perspective, it's not true. Because the longer you make the password, the greater the probability people <coughs> will write it down. And that lowers the safety, the reliability of the socio-technical system, even though I've improved the safety of the technical system. So that's why you know, you've got to see it outside of the lab. Um, it's also hard because when we're talking about programs, these technical, technological artifacts could be otherwise. You know, there's always a design space. I could have designed my program a million different ways. And when I evaluate it, am I evaluating this particular manifestation of the idea, or do I want to claim this applies to all possible manifestations of it? Also, there's all this new stuff coming along, whole new programs, uh, new opportunities. So I haven't got time to rigorously test everything. So how do I decide what I'm going to bother testing. So my frustration is I feel that a lot of the current research methods are kind of like a scalpel. You know, if you know what you want, you can get to it. It's very precise and accurate. And I feel I'm trying to you know, hack my way through the jungle with a scalpel. And it's not appropriate. What I want is to invent a machete. Um, a lot of traditional science is about figuring out a question and then answering that question. And the figuring out of a question, nobody ever talks about the method of how you go about doing that. And in these sort of wide open areas of whole new kinds of technologies and new people using it, the hard point is the starting point. How do you even figure out what is the question that you want to ask in the first place? And what might be some methods to help you invent the right question to ask? And then, you know, you can use your methods to try and answer the question. But even figuring out the right question to ask is really important. Because the danger is that if you've got a research method in your hand, maybe that influences the, ki the, re uh, the kinds of questions that you even think are possible to ask because they're answerable by the method you're holding. So you just may have a whole blindness, a whole category of other questions just because of the method you've got. So here is the famous waterfall method um, from software engineering, uh, often claimed to have been invented just to, in order to be knocked down. But I think we all recognize it from software engineering classes as this is how some people say some software development projects should be done. And then generally they've shown that in order to say, but it doesn't work for another category of software development methods, and so I've invented a, another software development project so I've invented a new method that's better than it. So when might the waterfall method work? 
Well, maybe if you've done this time and time again, and when is it very likely not to work when you've never done anything like this before? And so I put it to you that this is where you see the waterfall method. Well, my application of NSF, first I'll do that, then I'll do that, then I'll do that, then I'll write a paper and it'll all pop out the end. Um, and it's very strange when we're talking about research that you can turn research into such a production line. Uh, and then we write it up, and it's again, well, I did that, and then obviously logically I did that, and then obviously logically I did that, and then obviously that popped out because I'm a genius. Um, and this, this is very disconcerting to a lot of graduate students who read papers that imply everybody else does that. And they say, oh, I'm doing all over the place, and I'm doing that, and I try that, and it's like, I'm obviously not a good researcher because what I do bears no relation to what I read everybody else says they're doing. To which you have to say, that's because they lied. <laughs> they tidied it up after the event. So um, we have this method, the waterfall method, that sort of raised, and it may, you know, may well work when you know what you're doing. Uh, it seems to be clumsy when you're doing um, innovative software development. When you're trying to do research, you wouldn't think that the waterfall method would work as, as a, an analog for how you go about doing research. Um, so it makes you wonder, well, if there's the waterfall method of doing research, uh, and I don't like it, what might be some other ways of doing research? Well, you've got things like the spiral method. Um, and the problem is, I think it's a great way of doing it. You try it out, you analyze it, you figure it out, you do it again, and then you do it again, and then something good pops out the end. Um, the problem is, I'm not so sure that many research proposals, so I'm going to do this, I'm going to try it, and then I'll discover I've done it wrong, so I'll do something different. Please give me the money. Uh, no. Um, but I do think that that's what people actually do very often. It's just they don't say that's what they're going to do. So here's a disconcerted <laughs> What would happen if we actually told the truth about how we really do research? Um, in our grant proposals and in our write-ups. Um, and, you know, Bruno Latour has dis, you know, studied scientists, um, but I wonder if some of the things that he found about how a lot of the work of lab scientists is about, you know, taking an idea and basically building up a stronger and stronger rhetorical case for why this idea works, and then you assemble more and more evidence um, until more and more people believe it, and your job is to sort of be convincing it everybody else of it. Maybe we could be thinking about things like that. Why is this a problem? Well, if we're messing around with socio-technical systems, as I am, they're very grubby and they're very messy. Um, and so I would like some methods that embrace this mess. And I don't think I'm going to find many of these methods sitting on a shelf of research methods. Oh, well, grab that one. Um, so I think I'm going to have to be thinking about how to actually design methods methods. Um, and it's strange we don't often talk about method design. We talk about method selection. Okay, we've got these methods on the, on the shelf. You can choose. You have you know, good reasons. This method is good for that. This method is good for that. So you figure out what you want to do and you pull it off the shelf. But just as, you know, as a group of computer scientists, they're forever building things. You know, the act of design of building a computer program is something that people do, and you can study the processes of design and say, okay, yeah, this, this guy not only builds things, but he's got some very interesting design processes, and I can learn from that and teach somebody else. How might you actually talk about the process of designing your research methods, as opposed to saying, oh, well, where did that come from? Oh, I had a flash of genius, because I'm a genius, and it just popped into my head. Um, you know, uh, how did you design your program? Oh, I had a flash of genius, popped into my head. Well, you know, no, surely you have some methods of how you went about designing your program. So surely you might have some methods about how you go about designing your research. Now, some existing research methods, I claim, cope with mess by tidying it away. And a lot of controlled experiments do that. You know, rigorous controlled experimental design is about getting rid of all the mess, so you just measure the thing that you want. And I'm saying, well, that's perfectly legitimate if you know what it is you want. But often I worry that I may tidy away something in the mess that's really what I care about. So I want methods that embrace mess rather than tidy it away. So here's an inspiration, which is extreme programming. 
And I need to say, I have never done extreme programming, read about it, sounds like a nice idea. Um, I'm intrigued by it because it seems to me to have been designed, developed, and refined precisely to address some of the problems that programmers have with traditional software development processes that seem to me strongly analogous to the problems I have with the doing of research. And just as sort of, you know, as the waterfall method is to extreme programming, so extreme research is to these more traditional, rigorous scientific methods. So might we look at some of the elements of extreme programming and might we look at some of the design processes that led to the design of extreme programming to help us think about how we might design some research methods that will help us embrace messiness. So why did these people come up with XP? Um, well, a whole load of reasons, but some that really intrigue me is it's really hard to find out what the requirements are. Um, you're dealing with clients, they're not computer scientists, so they don't necessarily know what to ask for. Um, they know what it is they do, but there's an awful lot of things they do that they don't actually remember that they do. So you build what they ask for, and then they say, no, no that's not what I want, I want something else. So then you build it again. Um, so you have this problem of understanding what the real requirements are and how that's different from the articulated requirements. And even if you can find the underlying implicit requirements, the world keeps on changing. They have this billing system. And first of all, they to describe and say, well, this is what we do. And then you say, oh, do you mind if I sort of follow you around? And, and you say, well, what about this bill? I say, oh, yeah, that's an exception. That's what we do on this one. What about this one? Oh, that's an exception. What about this one? Oh, that's an exception. And at a certain stage, you start to think, like, is there anything around here that's not an exception? Um, and sometimes it was they give the ideal state, which is how they used to do it years ago, but they don't anymore. The world's moved on and everything's an exception. Or sometimes it's the world is so complicated that they've created this idealized billing that's like a centroid, and everything else can now be very nicely explained as just little exceptions to that. But they never actually do the one they've just told you about but it helps you make sense of all the others. So it's a very good human problem-solving way of explaining to another human being what we do as an idealization and exceptions of. But it's an absolute disaster if you try and program, if you think that's the central one. So everything is kind of changing, so how does XP address it? Um, well, in many ways, similar to what happens in research, you, know, you start off with one thing, you build it rigorously, you test it, you check it out, and then you gradually add things to it. Um, so, sounds nice. Um, it intrigues me um, that extreme programming um, and software engineering um, look very different, but they seem to be kind of compatible. So, again, if we've got software engineering and its manifestation of extreme programming, maybe we have research and this new invented manifestation I haven't thought of yet, which is extreme research. So what are some other things? And again, I'm just going to bundle together a whole category of work on this, extreme programming, agile programming, all these others. What are some of the things that they do, particular things they do, and then some of the approaches to design that we might be thinking about? So one is like pair programming. Now, why do they do that? Um, I can think of at least two reasons. One. Three. One is you can spot bugs. Um, the person can say, why did you do that? Um, you externalize the design rationale. The why did you do that? Now, we know it's very hard to make any computer scientist document their code. Why? Well, you know, coding is what I'm here for. And writing stories about what I'm coding isn't, you know, my boss makes me do it, but I don't like it. Um, and why, why is this being documented? Oh, so that in 20 years' time, when you've gone somewhere else and somebody's maintaining your code, um, they'll find that useful. So you're writing for a hypothetical person you're going to never meet, and you can't really imagine them, and you're not very good at writing, which is why you got into programming in the first place. <laughs> and is it surprising people don't do it? Um, but if you're sitting next to somebody, they say, well, why do you do that? Um, firstly, they th you, you, you may say, oh, I didn't mean to do that. That was a mistake, so that's the debugging. The second is you're actually going to verbally give a design rationale. So we've now externalized the design rationale. And the third bonus is if I say to you, why did he, you do that, you're going to explain to me, and I may learn something about your programming technique. So I may be learning about the process, and you are 
you're necessarily reflecting on the process in order to explain it to me, so you may actually get better at doing it as well. So lots of benefits from pair programming. Um, there's a very strong emphasis on testing. Now, this is where it looks really promising, but we're going to have to do some work to turn it into extreme research. Because as I understand extreme programming, they try and automate the testing. And I have great difficulties imagining how I can automate the kind of socio-technical testing that I want to do. But they do testing early and often, OK? And I want to do testing early and often. Probably not automated, but it's interesting to think, how do the testing methods, which we call evaluation in research, they're normally very rigorous and very slow and very careful. And how could we do them earlier, quicker, and dirtier, um, and then go round the loop uh, many more times? They focus on lots of little uh, chain changes and always having something that works at any one time. And you gradually expand the, the functionality. And I think that's kind of interesting um, and different to often what we try and do in research is find some really interesting research question and do one big experiment to definitively answer that problem. That's a big lump of stuff, as opposed to these little incremental changes and little incremental tests. And what would little incremental bits of research be that's useful as opposed to sort of you know, the pejorative least publishable unit? They don't try and get it all right in one go. Um, and certainly XP really focuses on the functionality. And I'm more interested in sort of the interface design and usability. But this might give me some ways of thinking about it. And what I'm sort of challenging those of you who've done any kind of extreme or agile programming is sort of run through in your mind some of the techniques you've used and think about how they might be either directly mapped into solving a research problem or indirectly mapped. So that, you know, the, we may not use the same technique, but we might use the same heuristic of how you got from regular programming to extreme to get from regular research to extreme research. So I'll be thinking of those, and I shall invite you to share those a bit later on. So how are we going to do this? Um, well, we know that regular research methods are slow, expensive, but very careful and very rigorous. Um, and why do I have this problem? Well, they don't seem to work in the kinds of things that I'm interested in here, which is a sort of you know, horribly embedded, situated, uh, people being creative. Uh, I want to look at learning episodes in the workplace, and their most successful ones are those that take 10 seconds. So you're hanging around, doing ethnography, oh, nothing's happening, work, 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 oh, learning episode, oh, work, 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 learning episode. So you, they, they're rare events. If you know, if they're working well. And when they're slow, it's when they go wrong. So studying them, even with a, a, using ethnographic methods, which I'm a big fan of, um, it's still a rather inefficient method, because an awful lot of hanging around. So what might we do to sort of speed up this process? I'm interested in learning. And the more I study learning, the more I find it sort of smooshes out in a million different directions. So as I said, it starts off, you think you're looking at learning, but then it gets interleaved with work, and then it gets interleaved with problem solving. And then I get stuck and ask you for help, and before you can even tell me what the right thing to do is, you've got to help me get out of the mess I was in because I tried to learn on my own, and I've now messed up my system. Um, and then people adopt these technologies and mix them around. And the interface can totally swamp the functionality, as those of you who have done HCI will know. Generally, in a negative way, a bad interface can get in the way of really good functionality. But sometimes it's the other way around. Um, some of my frustrations with a lot of research papers is they do all this very careful analysis, and then they come up with these really feeble design implications of, oh, it would be better if the interface was easier to use. Well, yes, that's true. But did you really have to spend you know, all those hours of work in order to tell me something that's so blindingly obvious? Um, sometimes they have this really rigorous definitive proof of something that I always thought was true anyway. So you've not told me anything other than finally somebody's actually proved that the sun rises every morning. And you know, it is strange nobody actually bothered to prove it before. But you know, I didn't really, you know, I want to be told something that's surprising, something that's counterintuitive. And so many people go and do an ethnographic study and then tell me things. And I think, well, isn't that obvious? Couldn't you have like, written down and put in a sealed envelope all the things you thought you were going to see in the study? Then you do the ethnographic study. Then you open the envelope and say, oh, yeah, got that, got that, got that, got that. So I've confirmed those. 
But I really can't pretend I discovered those in the ethnography because I already wrote them and they were in the envelope. But here are some things that I predicted I see and I didn't see. Oh, that's surprising. And here are some things I found that I didn't predict. That's also interesting. But pretending that everything you saw in the ethnography you know, is a justification for doing the ethnography <coughs> seems to me a bit of a cheat because I'm sure you could have sat down and thought of some of those in advance. And so the question is, like, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to verify something or validate it? Or are we just trying to just discover it? You know, what are you trying to prove? So I'm interested in this sort of learning approach. Um, and you know, I sort of, one of my heuristics is follow the learning and focus in on that wherever it happens. A lot of it is collaborative. And I've studied lots of different places, um, including a castle. Um, but the reason for trying to study lots of different applications by lots of different people in lots of different places is to look for you know, what is surprisingly similar you know, in what way do mashup programmer computer scientists have something in common with secretaries, in common with postdocs in astrophysics? So we're all maybe combining existing applications together to do something. So you get these recurrent themes, situated social informal learning. Um, and when you look at individuals, the same person can do some things completely differently. So, lots of things going on. Um, we now also have crowds and clouds. So, there's resources out there that people can use. And these may be other people. And they may be other software applications, little web resources that you can use. Um, so, we've got a certain degree of software abundance. It's not just that people are building stuff from scratch. And so this is very nice for the people, building by assembly. It's jolly sight easier than building from scratch. But studying it can be really hard. So I've got various examples. I'm just going to you know, go through a couple of these. Um, but if you want to ask me about any of the others um, later on, um, I want to emphasize that I'm, this talk is inspired by various different projects where I keep on seeing the same kinds of problems, the same kinds of thematic issues. And I suspect the same kinds of designed research methods might have helped to get to the truth a bit faster. So the first one is going to be talking about mashups. And again, I just want to show my age and say, when I was a graduate computer scientist, you started with a blank screen, you know, and then you spent many, many months building a program. And then because I was interested in AI intelligent tutoring systems, I then stick somebody in front of it and evaluate it. And then it would all go horribly wrong. And then I go and rebuild it and test it again. Um, and that's what you did. And now, the young people of today, what happens? Um, they do something very different. Um, and because of this available software that's out there, um, some of my doctoral students, I sort of give them a challenge to do. And they'll wander off. And I, you know, a couple of days later, they'll come up with a mashup. Um, and what they've done is taken some existing web services um, and fitted them together. And the gluing of the code in mashup programming is still a bit arcane. But even that, what you can do is programming by Google. You just type in and say, oh, how do I convert the input from some web service into a format that Google Maps wants? And if you're lucky, somebody's already written it, and there's a bit of code you can copy and paste in. If you're really lucky, it'll work as is. More likely, you'll need to do a bit of tweaking to make it happen. But again, you're not building from scratch. You're using some pre-existing resources to assemble. And that is really, really fast. So I'm claiming there's software abundance out there. Um, we've still got constraints of time and money and certainly expertise. Mashup programming is the most ugly code I have ever seen in my life. It's you know, really hard to do these conversions between one input process output to the next input process output. But again, you've got programming by Google. You can leverage off what some other people have done. And so you can, you can apply this sort of remix culture that we normally talk of in terms of like you know, music videos, but I think it equally applies to innovative software development of just throwing things together that may work at least enough as a proof of concept. And if it's a mashup, if it's a se sequence of web services, it's now on the web. So I can test it outside the lab. And that's very different from when I was a grad student. And my flaky little prototype worked on one Sun workstation. 
And I never managed to port it anywhere else. There was a whole load of idiosyncrasies there. So I had to bring people into the lab to test it. Now, if these things are web services, they're online, so they are testable. And you can also invite people either to take part in your experiment or say, we've got some software. If you'd like to use it, feel free. And you know, some people will try it out out of interest. But then if they could keep on using it, it must meet, be meeting some of their needs. So we now actually have a situated experiment. People are choosing to use my application, not because I'm paying them to come into my lab, but because somehow they're getting some use out of it. So we now have got authentic situated use, which is normally very hard to design an evaluation for. And you kind of get it for free if you hack together some web-based applications. So here's an example of one. Um, this was a doctoral student. I was teaching a class in um, rapid prototyping and evaluation. And he had this vision, uh, because he was a computer scientist, now in a library school, um, and he noticed that he and many other graduate students had this sort of problem of like, writing papers. Um, and the more diligent ones were quite happy reading, reading, reading lots more papers, but never quite got around to writing their stuff. Um, and so he was saying, well, wouldn't it be interesting if you could more tightly integrate the writing, searching, and reading process, as opposed to them having them as separate applications. And he built some paper prototypes the week we were doing paper prototyping. And it sounded kind of nice, but none of us in the class really quite knew what he was going on about. And then the next week was I, like, you know, challenge to try and build it. And he sort of hacked together um, a little mashup. And again, I'm not going to try and risk running a demo of it, but on up here is a word processor. So I think this originally did it in Writely now Google Docs. Um, so it's a web-based word processor. It then uh, hooked it up to um, a number of different web services that try and do keyword and phrase extraction, um, which were these keywords up at the top right. And then he passed those on to various digital libraries as queries to produce some results uh, that you see at the bottom right. So what happens is you go in, you brainstorm your ideas into the word processor. The system is just extracting keywords and making suggestions of things you might want to read on the right-hand side. And the first remarkable thing was as soon as he hacked this together, everybody in my class, including a group of computer scientists who really had no clue what he was on about when he'd done a paper prototyping, suddenly got it. We suddenly realized what it was that he was going on about because we had to see it working. And this was a moment of revelation, because I'd said, oh, yes, well, non-computer scientists have real, really great difficulties envisaging what a piece of software, a piece of innovative software would be, because they can't kind of run it in their heads because they're not computer scientists. And like, half the people in that room were computer scientists, and we couldn't envisage it until we actually saw it working. So that's sort of stage one. Um, stage two was, as we saw that, we realized that there's something weird about these hacked together things that sometimes it doesn't have to be good, it just has to be good enough. So as you're typing in, it's pulling out some keywords. Often it pulls out completely useless keywords, so it's not that great at doing it. And then when it does these searches in ACM Digital Library, it comes up with some suggested readings, and these belong in various categories. One is the completely wrong and irrelevant category. The other is highly relevant, but I've already read it, so it's not doing me any good. And then the very rare category is, oh, that's really interesting. I think I actually want to read that. And that's a very small proportion. So if you analyzed its suggestions from the perspective of traditional information retrieval, you'd say, this is rubbish. You know, I mean, we were better than that in 1960. You know, this is just really not very good. But when we tried it out on people, they really quite liked it um, as a tool to help them write their essays. And the question was, why? And partly is, it's, it's ambient nature. You're not typing in queries. You're just writing your essay, and suggestions come up. So people seem to be very tolerant about not very good suggestions um, most of the time if they don't have to do much work. Um, and the fact that it made suggestions of things that they already knew about, they didn't mind, because that increased their trust in the system. It's like, oh, he's doing some things right. It's just like not very useful, because I already know that. And then occasionally, just because it only occasionally pulls a rabbit out of a hat, they think that's really exciting. So they're much more tolerant of it than if they had to go to Google and type it in and get you know, three relevant results out of 50. The other interesting thing was because he'd done it as a mashup, and now um, all of us in the class could see what he was doing, 
many people are saying, oh, why don't you use this other keyword extraction unit? Why don't you use this other word process? Why don't you link it up to this other digital library? Why don't you, you know, have things where you can save things and throw away? So we had a whole load of suggestions. And it was quite remarkable to me that every other time that I've been advising a CS student who's gone off and built a really quite interesting piece of code, and then I come back and say, why don't you change it? They're very, very resistant. Like, I have invested 15 weeks of my life in this algorithm, and now you're saying people can't use it. People are stupid. You know, they must be reconfigured. You know, my algorithm is right because I've worked so hard on it, and I'll tweak my algorithm. But there's no way I'm going to throw away my algorithm and start again just because you've told me you know, you've evaluated it doesn't work. Anatoly was saying, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that algorithm isn't very nice. I'll, I'll just rip it out and put in another one. Uh, because it was just a web service, and he didn't care. And so we'd rip out one algorithm, uh, keyword extraction, plop in another that we suggested, find out that was actually worse than the one we had before, take it out, put it back in again. And he didn't care, because he was not emotionally invested in this code. You know, he was just assembling the Lego bricks. He wasn't handcrafting the Lego bricks. So that, that was really kind of intriguing to me, is how this prototyping culture can lead to a letting go of your code, as opposed to sort of the enormous emotional investment you get with it. So that was one example of very rapid prototyping. Um, here's another example of the other end of it, is if we can now get to the stage where we can build in a morning, can we test in an afternoon? Now, at the moment, we, I think, within computer science, we're getting better and better and better at developing rapid prototyping techniques. So we can assemble these things, we can build really fast. But if we're talking about socio-technical systems, we need to build and then evaluate. And if it's building in the morning, test in over three months. Build in the morning, test over three months. That's not really the extreme programming cycle of build, run the automated test, rebuild, run the automated test. So how might we speed up the evaluation process? Now, we really clearly we're going to have to give things up. We're not going to be able to do the kind of rigorous evaluation that you do when you test over three months. Um, but I think it's worth asking provocative questions. And a big argument that's been running for many, many years in human-computer interaction is how, how big an N do you need for doing a user test? Um, and Nielsen and others have been advocating you know, for various sort of pragmatic reasons that as you test one more person, you find more and more um, usability bugs but the curve starts to flatten, surprisingly, at five. Um, and there's a huge fuss and bother, and people say, oh, no, five's far too low. Argue, 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 back and forth. There's lots of tests, lots of careful analysis of it. Um, and I'd like to ask a different question, which is, like, what can you get out of a user test with a sample size of one? It may not be definitive, but is it enough to get you to the next stage? And... Now we're down to that. How even more extreme can we do it? Can we do a user test where we just do 10 minutes preparation? Can we do a user test that only lasts 10 minutes? Can we do a user test that then takes 10 minutes of analysis and then go back and do uh, more, more iterations, more redesigns? What are the things you can measure this way? And what are the things you will totally fail to measure? They just wouldn't crop up in those circumstances. And I think it's interesting to explore how you might design different kinds of extreme methods like this. So I'm not saying, oh, I've invented this method and everybody should adopt it. I'm saying, I found a point in the design space of evaluation methods, and everybody else's methods are way over here, and I seem to be here all on my own, and it's not like I've got the right one, but there's a whole space here. We don't even talk about it. How might we design evaluations to get what we need out of it so it's rigorous enough? And this partly came out um, of some outreach work I was doing at the conference museums and the web. So this is with a load of cultural heritage professionals for whom usability testing is totally alien. And so we were running things like workshops and tutorials on how to do user testing. Um, and we did some public user tests, which we sort of like ran as a game show. Somebody come up onto the stage and we do a user test in front of them and try and encourage the audience not to shout out, no, no, click on that button there. But the point of this was to illustrate to people who'd never seen user testing um, that it was not a mystical process and they should go home and do regular, rigorous user testing. However, what we found was, to the best of our knowledge and validating with the people whose site it was, the results we were finding from a 10-minute user test 
they were taking furious notes. They were going to change that when we get back home. So we had these slots. We had an hour, half hour slot. Um, we'd have a, take a volunteer outside the room who hadn't used the site before, do 10 minutes of analysis, 10 minute user test, um, 10 minutes of what we've seen in the user test and design recommendations, then on to the next site. And as I say, in that, that 10 minute of user test over a 30 minute whole slot, we were getting results that people said were useful. So that made me realize that, you know, the technique of user testing can stand an awful lot of abuse. You know, this is not science. I don't want to pretend it's science. But there's things you can do if you do this carefully that you can still get some useful results out of. So I've decided now that you know, the trick is to find what are the big changes. Um, so I'm not interested in these sort of tiny percentage changes because then you have to use the rigorous methods. And I think these crude methods work for sort of the low-hanging fruit, the really huge changes and how to go about doing that. Um, so here are just some other techniques that I've been playing around with to help do this kind of analysis when you don't have a lot of people, you don't have a lot of time, uh, but you can look closely at things. And I think there's a lot to be done by trying to do something like affordance analysis, where you look at an interface and say, well, what's it likely to be good at? What's it likely to be bad at? What kinds of features is it likely to enable? Let's stick somebody in front of it, see what we see, let's be very careful at noticing what we see that is surprising to us, what are the things we expected, and can we triangulate this with something that somebody else has mentioned in passing in the literature? And if we've got a very tiny n, let's concentrate on within subject variations. How come we found that bit really kind of easy and this bit really kind of hard? It's the same person, um, and particularly when that is surprisingly easy and that bit is surprisingly hard, can we see what's in there that will give us some clue about changing the design? Um, and one of the reasons that I've got into open source usability is just because it's open, that you get an awful lot of these externalized discussions of the design processes, um, but also in the tech support forums where people just sort of talk about what they're finding confusing. So you, this, in a sense, they've done part of the user testing for me. So I've got a large data set out there to look at. So one last example to illustrate this, this kind of approach. Um, we're coining this word patchwork prototyping to say that you, know, you can do rapid prototyping in build from scratch, or you can do it like building a patchwork quilt where you get existing bits of stuff and you stick it together. And those existing bits of stuff might be commercial off the shelf, or it might be web services, or it might be open source, or it might be any combination of those. Um, and can you put them together sufficiently quickly that when you stick them in front of somebody and say, oh, that's not what I want, I want something else, you can change it very, very quickly. So here's one setting where we were trying to do it. Um, and part of a larger project which uh, is looking at a whole load of different projects that are digitizing cultural heritage artifacts in libraries, museums, and archives. And there's 800 of these collections. And our job is to use the OAI metadata harvesting to suck all this stuff into our central repository. This was funded by the IMLS, who had funded all these separate 800 projects. And they basically wanted a, a one-stop shopping for all their projects. Um, and now you've got that, you have to say, well, like, why, were we, why were they doing all this digitizing in the first place? It's often to help humanities scholars do the things that humanities scholars do. So they want access to the primary materials. Digitized stuff works very well. Um, but um, how do you help the, the humanities scholars to get a sense of what have you got? If you are a scholar and you walk into a library or you walk into a museum or indeed you walk into an archive, they're very good at getting a sense of what's there just by wandering around. The physicality of the place and the physicality of the layout gives them a sense of like, what's there, what might be interesting, or what's surprising. And, and they're very good at looking for things that to them are anomalous or interesting they want to delve in in more depth. And I think we have designed the equivalent of the closed stack library. So the open stack library, you walk in, you wander around the shelves, and then you serendipitously find things you're interested in. A closed stack library, there's a little cubby hole, 
and there's a librarian on the other side, and you say, I would like this rare book. And the librarian writes it down, scuttles off, brings it back to you, and says, here it is. And you say, thank you very much, and you read it. Um, so that's fine if you know exactly what it is you want. But you can't go to that little cubby hole, closed stack library, and say, what have you got? And they're going to say, oh, 20 million artifacts. And you say, can I see them? And they say, no, just tell me what you want, and I'll go get it for you. Uh, and I would claim that what we had done in this project is done that, but instead of the little cubby hole with the librarian on the other side, we have a little search box with an algorithm on the other side, which is fine if you know exactly what you want. But you can't type into that little box, what have you got? Um, so we are trying to say, how might you draw some pictures of that? So I think what you need is a data visualization. It needs to be low cost because you haven't got any money to do anything better. But much worse, many of these humanities scholars are very good at texts, but they really don't, they're not used to diagrams. So you can't say to them, oh, what picture would you like of the data? What data visualization would you like to say? I've never had one before. Pie chart? Ooh, witchcraft. You know, so they're not used to this. Um, and it's an interesting design challenge. So what we tried to do was go to a museums and the web conference where there were humanities scholars who had some sort of techie background and try them out um, with a dashboard, here it's a paper prototyping one, of various kinds of visualizations that might give you a sense of what is there in a collection. And then we sort of produce this using, I hope you can recognize, many little web services. We're using Google Maps, using Wordles, um, all of those are publicly available resources. We're just plopping in the data. Many eyes is very useful on that. And then the Indianapolis Museum of Art had assembled these resources, which was more for management stuff, into sort of this dashboard. So we're taking the metaphor of a dashboard, which is being used in sort of commerce, and we're trying to do it to help, say, to answer the question, what is it that you've got? And again, each of these visualizations is very cheap. You know, they didn't take much effort to do. None of them is particularly good, but if you've got enough of them all together, maybe, they can, maybe they're good enough. And again, this, this intrigues me. It's a different approach to doing information visualization than our colleagues up the road in Illinois, the National Center of Supercomputing Applications. When they do data visualization, it's of a tornado. It costs them $10 million, and it's gorgeous. When I do visualization, it's like I slap something in the Google Docs, it takes 15 minutes, I stick it in front, um, of a humanities scholar and say, well, that's kind of nice, but couldn't you make it do this instead? So it's that sort of that low road of little tweaks and changes along the way. Here's another one. This is probably the most ugly visualization I've ever been involved with. This was an undergraduate project um, at the, um, involving the Greenstone Digital Library developed in Waikato in New Zealand. These are fields in the metadata format Dublin Core. And basically, you scroll down a set and you say there's a blue blob if there's a value in that field um, if, for that record, and otherwise there's not. And you scroll down, and you can look for anomalous shapes in there. So if this is your data set, you will notice weirdnesses or not weirdnesses in here, and that can be a very quick way of getting a sense of maybe our harvesting was wrong. Maybe there's some errors when we harvested, maybe there's some errors in there. Do you see huge loads of blank spaces, or do you see these weird antiphases? Is it always the case? It's either that one or that column, but never the two. You scroll down, get a sense of it, then you can ask the expert, is that normal? Is that what you want? Or is there something wrong with it? So a very crude visualization, very quick and easy to develop, but is useful enough for the experts to start doing things with it. So I shall end there and entertain questions, and I've got many more slides to hopefully illustrate any of the questions you may have. Um, and I'd be really interested if you can think of other metaphors of extremeness or agility that may work you know, in the context of doing research. So thanks very much. Mary. So I was curious, as part of your rants, you, know, you talked about the waterfall model of paper writing and how yes. sort of what's accepted in academic circles. So I was wondering how you found it to be trying to publish research using these kind of approaches. Are people receptive to that? Do you, do you actually write it up differently? Do you write it up in a way that 
reflects the style more and what that experience is like? <laughs> I, I've tried to, but I, you have to say, I'm on sabbatical this year. One of my big jobs in a sabbatical is to write the papers to justify these methods. Because, mm -hmm. of course, what happens is I write a paper, and again, if it's a Kai paper, you've only got 10 pages. So you've got to spend so much time explaining what the problem is in the first place, and then maybe how you've built it, and then something about how you've evaluated it. And I've got like two paragraphs to explain why I'm doing it this way, as opposed to the way that all the reviewers think I should be doing, you know, controlled experiment. And there's never enough room to squeeze it in to a regular paper. So I think part of my job is to write another paper to justify these methods. So, so I try to, but I've, I've had problems in squishing it in. Well, then I guess a, a related question is if, if, if the approach is to do extreme research, is there a, an equivalent extreme publishing? I or should think you I, be yes. publishing everything via tweets? Yes. <laughs> you uh, no, but again, I, I want to try blogging as one way of doing this. I'm not sure I want, I, I think I'm too old for tweeting. <laughs> I still find blogging a bit kind of novel. Um, but I, I think one way is to try these alternate publications um, because, you know, one of the trends of e-science is to share more and more of the stuff. So, you know, the idea is you'll share your data set and maybe you'll share your, your data set analysis programs that you did or the macros you developed in Excel so somebody can replicate what it is you've done. And I think it's incumbent on me to sh you know, say, well, I've invented this method, here's what it is, here's why I think it's good, and here's how you can try it at home too. Because you can imagine that. I mean, just to build on that, it, it, part of the benefit of extreme programming, like the pair programming, is that um, one person sort of points out errors to the other. You can imagine that you might get more benefit even out of your 10-minute your user study sessions if instantaneously after the session was over you do the the one minute write up, right? Wow, yes. Of what yes. you learned, and yes. then you can get feedback from other people about do they agree with your interpretation of, of the data, and that might help you then refine your next. That is really interesting, because of course, what we've done on this is we write up for our benefit immediately after. Mm -hmm. And I found it very useful to do like pair studies. If there's two of us observing the user study, you get a lot out of it. But you're saying you could broaden it out right. even more, and that would yeah. be, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, would be really good. What do you think the impact is of these of, of the extreme approaches uh, on depth of and thoughtfulness of the kind of research that you do? Yeah. Like, you know, part of the thing you're doing with graduate students is to try to teach them how to ask a good research question. Yes. As and presumably how to design a good visualization. Yeah. And if the methodology is just throw a billion things out there, and eventually you'll figure out one of them that's successful, and you'll learn. Mm -hmm what the attribute was, it seems like it's almost a waste of their time with lots of weeks and, and end users' time to look at all that stuff if it could have been done with one more thoughtful experiment for this graduate student to try. Yeah, I think this is a very fair question and one I struggle with. So the way I would address it is I think a lot can be done by a little bit more thought about what you're going to do going in, in, in advance. Um, and I see this problem both with, when I'm teaching design to computer scientists, the risk is, that, you know, well, I give them a problem, they come up with an idea, and then they want to go and implement it. And I would say, okay, slow down, let's think of six other ideas before we decide which one we're going to pick. Because, you know, ideas are not so precious that as soon as a light bulb goes off, you've got to run off and code it. So in that sense, I want to slow them down. But I want to say, look, I'm not saying we're going to spend months on that. I'm just saying let's just spend an hour or 15 minutes charting out the design space. I think there's something similar that you could do um, with just a few minutes charting out sort of the analysis space. And I think that's part of this sort of the sealed envelope heuristic that I'm advocating is something that I don't see that's done. It shouldn't take too long to do, but I think it can force some reflection. So, yeah, I, I really do want to have my cake and eat it, too. I want to be able to have these fast methods encouraging reflection at the same time. And I do recognize that students could misinterpret this as being, oh, you can just do any old crap. And, you know, it's, it's like Darwinian evolution. Just, like, breed lots of them and one amazing thing will pop out. If you yes. have a million computers serving, you know, a million different search pages a second, you could try a million different variations on the search pages to see which one might have an effect. Yeah. Just yeah. Wait for the data to come in to tell you how you should have been thinking about this. Cool. Yes. I mean, the same analogy exists in extreme programming, agile programming. Like people 
argue with. They're like, oh, you don't do any design. It's not true at all. It's just different. Yeah. So, you know, we've been actually doing, using methodology kind of like this in our product development. And so what we've done is we've set up sort of like a regular testing sessions. And then, you know, we you know, meet with our program managers and kind of evaluate the research questions that they have and see whether it's appropriate for this kind of methodology. You know, and at that point, we make the call as to whether actually to use the, you know, agile session mm -hmm. or do a full one usability session. So how do you decide between the two? What, what, what kinds of problems do agile extreme methods seem to be particularly good for? Um, so I work in enterprise software. Yeah, so the problem space is kind of big in my book. Yeah. Um, so generally, the problems that tend to fall better into the more agile space are the smaller, well-constrained problems. Yeah. And if they're big and ugly questions, then we need to do you know, a more involved method. Yeah, and so kind of you know bring the two together a little bit. You know, it may be that you know a you know tweaking UI in the agile session. I'll also add in you know some uh, you know qualitative questions and so forth to you know provide you know, rough data gathering that will lead us into bigger research questions later on. Yeah, so that, that is interesting because I often think you know social technical systems are big, messy, horrible spaces. But I think you know, my job as a researcher is to try and break those down into more manageable bite-sized research questions. However, yeah. an agile method, yes. but at the same time, you're feeding that data into the larger data set. Yes. And I think you know, by, the question is when you can have the iterations enable you to be rigorous. But also, I think that there may be methods of how you break down things into bite-sized chunks. And at the moment, I see those. You know, it's weird. When we talk about research methods in university, all we ever talk about is evaluation. You know, research methods means evaluation methods. It doesn't mean how do you scope a research question? How do you figure out that there is a research space that is strongly analogous to a design space? And you know, gradually, we're starting to realize we can teach design by talking about concepts in design space and how you, dis how you cope with that. But we don't do it in research space. And I see part of what I want to work to is to look at the methods of how people carve these problems into manageable units. Because I suspect that is articulable and teachable. But at the moment, you know, the, it implies it's you just, you just, you're just good at it. Just have a flash of information. That's what makes me good. Or why should I tell you how to do that? That would be giving away the secret source. Um, which is really ironic, seeing the whole point of science is to share techniques, but we don't seem to want to share that one. Um, and uh, you know, it's hard enough to do, as I say, teaching design to computer scientists, because they're not really used to, to it. And in my experience, um, learning computer scientists, I was never taught design. You know, if I was lucky, they created opportunities where I could figure it out for myself. You know, they constrain it so that I would have a good learning experience, but never actually taught you how to do design. I don't know that we actually teach how to scope out research problems. We just teach. Now you've got magically got the research question, which method to choose. We don't actually teach how to design methods much. Yeah. About already presumes the research question. You're talked to, you, you haven't talked at all, at least in this talk, mm. about how do you, do you figure out a research question when no. you have no idea what you could be looking for? No, so I haven't talked about it in this talk, but I, I, I do, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a, there's a pre-talk, or they're talking you know, temporally, that is how do you scope out these kinds of research questions? And I think that can be done using relatively quick methods, as opposed to just sort of sitting, staring at it. Um, but, yeah, I'm not sure I can make those up on the fly here. I mean, I think it's... Yeah. What you're implying is that, that you start with one and you're and you iterate on that, and then you may discover that they, you're asking the wrong question. Yeah, so that, that is certainly one part of it. But I think there is something about trying to scope out a research space, which is where you try and list a set of the areas in it. And then you may use reasoning by analogy from other domains to say, OK, there might be some areas in here. Um, and so I think you can you know, keep on pointing here as if this was a giant whiteboard. So you could write down some of the issues in the area and then say, OK, we're now going to look in on that. But I, I agree. Firstly, I agree I haven't talked about it here. And secondly, I don't think it gets talked about much 
anywhere as a technique to figure out you know, where you are in the larger space of research. I don't know, from what we've seen and from also what you talked about, there's a difference between communicating an idea and telling somebody else exactly how you did it. Yes. In order to teach them how to do it. Yes. And all the papers and things that people are writing about even pedagogy is all about um, just communicating an idea so that somebody can understand it as opposed to here's how I did it. But when you also see that when you look at a graduate student who's finishing and they're doing their dissertation talk or their job talk, they usually distill down their entire research area into a graph of two axes and they say all the other research fits onto this, these points, these are the most important ones, and mine's up here at the upper right because that's exactly where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, of, of two difficult axes. And it seems that people don't really get to the point where they can communicate their ideas clearly until they have a really good understanding of the research questions and the research space. And then at that point, then they could start asking what are the real research questions I should have been doing instead of wasting my time for four years on this. Yeah, yeah. But it took four years. Yes. Um, so I suppose, you know, one sense I want to speed that up a bit, you know, so you can make those mistakes earlier. And I think certainly you know, there, there are ways of doing micro studies just to try things out. Um, I'm sure it's the case that you only really, it's only at the end when you really understand it and you can say, OK, this is where I fit. But it's almost like you need two documents. There's the, here's the Reader's Digest condensed version. I've hacked my way through the jungle, and now it's really easy for you, and I can tell you how to get from A to B in the most direct way possible. So that'll save your time if all you care about is getting to B. But there's another story, which is how I actually really got from A to B, which will be very useful if you want to get from C to D, because I can then share you the technique of how I coped in the hacking process through the jungle and how I dealt with all you know, the twists and turns. And that's very different. You know, it's different <laughs> whether you're, you're talking to the people who want to get from C to D or the people who want to get from A to B, because you've cut it through. And that's where the, the nice tidied up research paper throws away all the dead ends but it doesn't help anybody who is going to be doing new research who needs to know how to cope with dead ends and maybe recognize the dead end faster than I did when I was going through. But I think on that topic, there is a distinction between the research paper and the research notebook. Yes. And we just don't have a tradition of sharing out our research notebooks except for Da Vinci's, which yes. is the only one that yes. ever really gets shared out, and people adore that one. Yes. Um, so maybe we just need a, a better tradition of sharing out our research notebooks and of learning how to keep them better. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah. That As analogous to suffering, too, at the end, you have your crud, your suffering, your produce, and you don't, well, if you have open source, you do share out your source control system. Kind of well, I think even, so, I mean, even that analogy, if you have an open source program and your whole revision history is in Mercurial and everybody is checking it out every time they check out your source, it's still way too much information to wade through. So really, I mean, you're sharing it in the sense that it's there and it exists, and if you wanted to, you could bisect and find bugs or whatnot, but it's not its not there in the way that we would like it to be there. It's not there as, you know, the tale of how I got from A to B. It's there as, you know, here's a ridiculous amount of data, and if you were to spend your lifetime digging through it, you could maybe figure out how I got from A to B. No, there's some interesting analysis that we've done. I'm having a hard time understanding how this could apply to research in mathematics or theoretical computer science or particle physics mm -hmm. or practical mechanics. It feels like a large part of this is good enough is good enough and exposed early to end users, but there aren't really end users in mathematics. End user, good enough isn't good enough. I mean, what we've been talking now about sharing the process of research or extreme publication might help, but even that's hard to see. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this is inspired by the messiness of socio-technical systems, where you don't even know what the variables are you should be worrying about in the first place. So there's this fear of asking the wrong questions. Um, and we know from computer-supported cooperative work that a lot has been learned from ethnographic studies going in, pointing out whole categories of things you didn't even know you should be worrying about in the first place. So it's inspired by that, but also acknowledging that ethnographic research is incredibly slow. So you know, is there a way of speeding that up? So it may be that um, within certain aspects of, of math and theoretical physics, it's constrained enough that you can, you can black box around and say, OK, this is a really hard problem. 
but I know it's everything is inside this box, is everything I need to care about, and everything outside this box I can safely ignore. And if, that's, if that is indeed the case, then I don't suppose any of these methods, because my methods are to do with that leaking in and out of the box and what's going on. But you might want to look at the processes used by, say, a mathematician. So it's more like the polya kind of argument. How, how do mathematicians get to an understanding? Um, how, do they, how do they develop proofs? So if you're interested in the process of proof development and you want to study that, and you'd normally want to study that in order to teach other people how to do it, then these methods, in a, methods analogous to this might be helpful to say, well, you know, what I'd really like to do is open up your brain and look inside, but you know, I can't do that. Or I could just keep on interrupting and say, why are you doing that, why are you doing it, why are you doing that? But then you couldn't be able to do it. So for those kinds of things, it would. But now, you see, what I've done is sneakily brought the human being back inside the box. And these, I think these methods always work around human beings. So when I'm studying the mathematician, I think they work. When it's studying the math, they may not work. kinds of style of research methodologies introducing into the results that we get? Um, as it currently stands, one big fear I have is it will only look at short-term things. So if you're just doing a user study in 10 minutes, you can only study the things that people do in 10 minutes. So that's a risk. Um, I think that one can be mitigated if you're doing a whole series of 10-minute studies over a longer period of time, so you can aggregate out of it. Um, so I, I, this is the interesting thing. I, th there's many ways in which I would want to study the same person over a very long period of time. I think there's a lot that we can get out of that. Um, and, and it's just, I want other, you know, other people are already doing large end studies. So I, I think, well, I want to find, to ask the question, what can you get out of a small n? And it's clear you lose what you lose by small n, but what you can gain is some degree of depth of you know, really getting to know that person. And if it's over time, how is their understanding evolving? And then you want to sort of somehow triangulate and say, well, was that person just mad? Are they unrepresentative? Are they unlike all other human beings? Um, or are they, you know, are they like everybody? That's also unlikely. But are there certain categories you know, how many more people do I have to study before I'm starting to think, oh, I've seen the same damn thing time and again. But that, so I think my bias is always to depth rather than breadth. And that's, I think I'm just sort of kicking against the problems that you have with large N, that you have to ask very, very focused questions and you may lose something. But I think there may be other things I'm losing too. And I think that's just something I want to go away and think about a bit more. Could prove challenging is something we see here is the more people you have and potentially the more times you see the same person, the bigger the researcher schedule the problem is. Because now you actually have to put them on your calendar somewhere yeah, yeah. and make large amounts of time to visit them. The more yes. pain you have, the larger amount of time you need to make space for this experiment. If a particular target population with you know that you need to recruit is is hard to so larger scale collaborative interactions are just harder to study. Because yeah. like, yeah, either you have to try and invite them all into the same place at the same time, or you go to where they are. But even you know, then, you've got to be there at the right place at the right time yeah, to study them. Students are doing these really short visualizations and, and potentially really fast trials to much longer, potentially, issues about the mechanics of scheduling and the mechanics of getting people in the same room, mechanics of running the study, which are, you know, in, from my experience, those are the parts that suck, as opposed to actually, once they've started, yeah. watching them use it and figuring out yeah. what's going on. So I have one trick that we, we addressed that problem in one particular case was we wanted to talk to lots of people with a background in cultural heritage and knew enough about technology. So we, we took the, the, the photos of everybody doing the design, was done at a conference. So rather than you know, going to a conference to present the results, we went to the conference to do data collection. Um, so that's like, well, we went there because that's where all the historians are. So you know, this was like the demo session. So everybody else, everybody else's table was, here's this neat computer application we've built. Isn't it good? Do you want to use it? And ours is like, we haven't built it yet. Tell us what you want. Um, uh, but because it was in the, the demo setting, 
everybody knew the game. Well, as you wandered up, you stood around on the periphery. If you're interested, you gradually come closer and closer in. You can stay as long as you like, and then you want to wander off to the next demo session. So we're playing off the demo genre, um, which allows people to understand what they're letting themselves in for, which in many ways sidesteps a lot of the, the problems of recruiting subjects for user studies, like, oh, what am I getting into? Is this like lab coats and electrodes, and how long is it going to take? Um, this is like, oh, you know, so a lot, there were several people who like, hovered on the outside and maybe shout out a few suggestions. Say, oh, do you want to get a bit, oh, no, I don't want to get involved, but then they still stay there and shout out a few more and then gradually will come in. So that was one way of, of sidestepping this whole recruitment problem because having to go to these people's home offices all the way across the United States would have been infeasible. But again, this is not going to be a universal solution. I think we have to invent ways of getting you know, access to it. Have to be consulted for every single instance of every piece, every design that you make? That's coming, that's the IOB paper coming soon, yes. This is the big problem that IOB hasn't caught up with the invention of new methods. We did have to get IOB permission for this, um, and of course people say, you had to get IOB to go to a conference, yes, because <laughs> we're doing data collection. Um, but, you know, I said to the IOB, well, we can't make people sign forms, because the whole point is, they're going to give that, you know, that woman sitting, standing in the back, maybe shouting out a suggestion. She hasn't even got close enough to pick up a form yet. But they, they were quite comfortable with us posting an informed consent form, you know, just behind where I'm standing. Um, so that, that was okay. But it, yes, it does lead to these sort of bizarre things of like, what even counts as data collection um, in these settings? Yeah? Have you thought about how how the sample could change over time depending on whether you're in the generative phases or the summative phases. There might be different samples that are mm. better at different parts of the, the life cycle of the research. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, yes, I have, and I think I'm trying to figure out how to argue this one. Um, early on, you can... You, if you discount carefully, you can make do with unrepresentative users. Um, so, for example, when we were doing user testing of museum websites, we were doing this at museums in the web conference. Um, so we had volunteers who'd never used the website before, but they were not like the average museum visitor. These were people who paid money to go to a conference on museums and the web. So they were museum professionals, and they were sufficiently techy to go to a museum in the web conference. But if you can make the a fortiori argument that I'm testing this museum website, I've picked some representative tasks, I asked this person who is a museum informatics professional who's never seen this website before to say, you know, imagine you're coming to this museum for the first time, you're going to be on holiday, and you want to know where is it, what's its opening times, and how much is it going to cost for a family of four? and they can't do that, then how much more so um, is it going to be difficult for people who have less skills? So that argument doesn't work if, you, if you're going to say this person is finding it more hard, more difficult than the average person will be. But I'm saying that for those, these were unrepresentative because they had a whole load of skills, and everything that they found hard is interesting data that probably ought to be fixed because your actual intended users will find it at least as hard. But everything they find easy, you can't say whether it's good or bad. So yeah, you, you can only focus on the negative evidence, but that's okay, because that's often what you do in formative evaluation. And so if I had a limited set of volunteers, and if I was able to, I'd rank it, so I'd test out on the more skilled, experienced people first to catch you know, some of the more blatant errors, and then work my way down the real intended uses the more novice ones. Um, but there are times where you may want to test some of the more advanced features, and those you want to say, oh, well, the, the absolute beginners, they wouldn't be using those. But I think it is a way of when you've got a very precious set of users, who are you going to pick first, and where can you get, get away with? But it, it requires a certain art of discounting to know what, what are you seeing, what is the background of the person you're seeing it with, and also, is there any evidence that this has been seen elsewhere? Um, so, you know, in our very tiny samples here, 
we'd find things like people would just get impatient and go off and do something else. Or they say, well, I've got, I would have gone and done this if I wasn't sitting here doing this user study. And there's a, quite a lot of studies who've also found this degree of impatience. So you can say, even though I've only just seen this in like one person or two people, I think it's fairly widespread because there's evidence of that kind of impatience popping up. And notice that a lot of the uh, people in that kind of audience would say, oh, yes, yeah, young people are impatient. You know, the Nintendo generation, they're in, impatient. And you know, now we've just seen it on a 40-year-old you know, museum professional. She got bored with your site. So, <laughs> so it's not likely the 16-year-old is going to be any less bored. Um, so though, again, that's that kind of discounting. Um, uh, it, it would be very difficult to argue that in a paper. And again, you need a whole load of stuff to argue it in a paper. But I think in terms of making pragmatic decisions of what needs fixing, and I found five things in which things you want to prioritize, it might be enough to make the decision of where to allocate the resources. Well, thank you very much, everybody. If you have any ideas of extreme methods that might work in research, if this has triggered any thoughts, please send me an email. Thank you.